Um, okay, so we are recording now. So if any of you are wanted criminals, keep that in mind. Keep yourself muted, your camera too. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so I'm Linda Black Elk. I'm the Food Sovereignty Skills Coordinator or Educator at United Tribes Technical College. I work within the land grant programs, which we're thinking about changing over to the Center for Food Sovereignty or the Great Plains Center for Food Sovereignty, who knows? Um, but I love being there. United Tribes is an amazing tribal college. If you're not familiar with tribal colleges and universities, um, they are literally universities that serve indigenous populations. And um, there's most of them, there's like 29 in the US. Um, and then there's a couple in Canada, um, things like that. And they're amazing. Most tribal universities are on reservations. United Tribes is actually in the city of Bismarck, North Dakota, which is on the traditional homelands of multiple tribes. Um, and this is also a land acknowledgement, but um, right now I'm, I'm on the traditional lands of the Ocheti Shakoi. Um, and if you don't know what that is, that's the um, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota peoples. That's the collective term. Uh, Ocheti Shakoi is the collective term for the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota peoples. Um, this is also the tr traditional homelands of the Nueta, Hidatsa, and Sanish peoples. And so I'm really proud to be here on their homelands, living and working and raising my children. It's, it's beautiful. My children are all Lakota and members of the Cheyenne River and Standing Rock nations. Um, so I'm very, very, like just thrilled to be here with you guys tonight. You know, um, throughout uh, the pandemic, uh, we have been hearing and listening to um, a lot of people describe their symptoms and something that people almost always describe. Even people who have very mild symptoms often experience some kind of burning in their lungs, okay? Uh, even if it's just for a day or a few hours, uh, most people who are affected, um, or who are diagnosed with COVID um, experience some type of lung burning or lung issue or difficulty breathing, right? And so I thought it would be really important for us to talk about lung support. But um, just so you guys know, I am asthmatic. Um, I have really terrible seasonal allergies. I'm allergic to certain animals. Um, and all of those will trigger my asthma. So, um, you know, I have... I, I'm invested in lung support for many reasons, not just uh, because of COVID. Um, my kids also, one of my children is asthmatic, the other has a reactive airway, and the third one, we're not sure, but whenever he gets sick, and you guys might know kids like this, whenever a kid, have you guys ever seen those kids, whenever they get sick, no matter what kind of sickness it is, it goes straight to their lungs right? Do you guys know kids like that? So my five-year-old is like that. Even sometimes um, when he has had strep throat, it has ended up in his lungs. It's crazy. So, um, and we, we have learned over time, he's five now, and we've learned over time to deal with that and to try to prevent it from going into his lungs. Uh, so we'll be talking about all kinds of lung support today, uh, plants for lung support. I actually have a PowerPoint to show you guys, and I, that feels super weird, because if you guys know me, you know that I'm just not the PowerPoint kind of girl. I want to do hands-on stuff with you guys. I want to, like, be out walking with you guys. Um, I want to be, you know, chilling with you guys and, like, making stuff hands-on. And I wish all of you right now had some beautiful juniper and honey. Um, I, I bet most of you within five minutes of your house, there's probably at least one juniper bush, okay? I, even if it's in someone's yard and you kind of have to sneak onto their lawn, don't, I'm not telling you to sneak onto anyone's property. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> don't sneak onto anyone's property to, to take stuff from their uh, juniper. You know, in, in all honesty, I can't tell you guys how often, you know, people, people think, um, okay, this past summer, there were all kinds of apples on people's trees in their yards, right? Beautiful apples. And they were just falling on the ground and rotting. And so I thought to myself, you know what? 
I bet these people would not mind if I picked some apples off their tree. So I would like go knock with my mask on back away from their door and say, hey, do you mind if I take a couple handfuls of apples from your, from your tree? And they were like, oh yeah, um, go ahead, you know? And it's the same way with juniper or pine or any other um, edible and medicinal plants if you, that you see in people's yards. Obviously you don't wanna raid people's gardens, but <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes people are just super open and kind. Um, I mean, think about it. I bet m the majority of the folks on this um, on, on this Zoom right now would be willing if you had, uh, uh, let's say, a flat cedar tree in your yard that was really healthy, you'd probably be willing to let someone take a handful of it, you know? Uh, so, mo and most people are like that, right? People are good. People are really good in general. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you need some of these medicines, you're not where sh sure where to get them, but you know that someone has a juniper tree in their yard or you know, um, uh, some horseradish plants growing in their yard, knock on their door and ask them. Just make sure to do it safely, okay? Um, so before we kind of get started and before I show the PowerPoint, I wanted to say that one of my favorite, very simple medicines for um, cough, cough in particular, um, is just a simple juniper and honey cough syrup. And I'm gonna show you guys how to make that right now. And then while we're visiting, I'm going to, um, uh, yep, Julie, I'm sorry. So Julie's asking if you can ask questions. Absolutely, Julie. Feel free to put them in the chat uh, if you have any questions, just as I'm talking, okay? Don't, you don't have to wait till the end and I'll try to get to them as we're going, okay? Um, but yeah, so I wanna get started with our, um, with our cough, cough medicine here. Um, I'm going to plug my hot plate in real quick. I have a hot plate right here. Hey, dear, could you come plug this hot plate in for me? I actually can't reach the, the plug. So I, I just have a, a burner right here and I have, um, sorry, I'm just, I have plants all around me to show you guys. Uh, I have just a saucepan. And I want to show you guys that I'm not really even measuring. I have some local raw unfiltered honey. Um, raw and unfiltered and organic are three words that I personally really like to see these days. They make things a little more expensive, but um, you know, they, it's also, they're, they're called those things for a reason. Raw means that it's not pasteurized. It's not cooked, okay? So this is raw honey that hasn't been cooked down, right? Um, and that's good because there's a lot of things in honey, nutrients, all kinds of stuff that will um, go off or degrade or die uh, at high temperatures. So raw is better when it comes to honey. It's the same way with vinegar. We use raw vinegar, right? Non-pasteurized vinegar, because we want all that cool bacteria swimming around in there. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but there are good bacteria, right? There's the bacteria that helps you break down your food in your tummy that's essential. And if you don't have those bacteria, you're kind of kind of screwed when it comes to digestion, okay? So um, raw is a good thing. Very good for your gut microbiome. Very good for your health. Unfiltered, I like that too, because um, it means that it has all that, you know, some there's some pollen in there and all kinds of stuff. So that's why that unfiltered and raw uh, is why honey, um, local honey can be so good to treat allergies. Do any of you guys have seasonal allergies? A spoonful of raw honey every day, it's not just because it's sweet and delicious. <laughs> it also has a very practical use. Raw honey um, sort of feeds you just a tiny bit of all the things you're allergic to, right? So it's almost kind of like inoculating you against those things that you're allergic to. So it's really good for you, um, particularly if you have seasonal allergies. So honey is a medicine in and of itself. I'm gonna say one more thing about honey before I move on to making this juniper honey cough syrup. And that is, um, I talk about this all the time, okay? But repetition is key. <laughs> so please pay attention to this one thing because I, I get on a soapbox about it every once in a while and it's so important. Please. Do not ever buy over-the-counter cough syrup, okay? Over-the-counter cough syrup, 
has a compound, a chemical in it called dextromethorphan. So when you see like Robitussin DM, gosh, I say this, I tell this story so much that Robitussin and Dimetap probably want to sue me, okay? But when you see Robitussin DM or like Dimetap DXM or whatever it's called, the DM and the DXM stand for dextromethorphan, okay? That is the quote medicine in there. Um, a lot of people think over-the-counter cough syrup is good for you or it helps to control coughs by soothing your throat, right? They think it's, oh, you know, it's a syrup, it's soothing. Uh, D, D, you know, that dextromethorphan must be like this soothing cough medicine. Not true at all. Um, dextromethorphan is actually classified as a disassociative, also known as a hallucinogen, y'all. A, hallucin a hallucinogen. Um, it actually acts on your brain. So, so, so uh, dextromethorphan acts on part of your brain to convince you that you don't have to cough. That's all it does. It does not do anything to heal you. It doesn't do anything to soothe the cough, nothing. It, um, it's terrible uh, in that it literally acts on your brain and it just convinces you that you don't have to cough. It is so hallucinogenic that um, it actually is used as a street drug now. You know, you can actually find people using over-the-counter cough syrup as a street drug, okay? So please don't have that stuff in your house. Here's the, here's the real cool key part. Um, uh, honey, raw honey, has been shown in numerous clinical trials. That means like actual, tri like actual scientific studies. Raw honey has been shown to control cough better than over-the-counter cough syrup, right? There's no reason to pay that money for over-the-counter cough syrup. There's no reason to give your family or yourself uh, that disassociative, the dextromethorphan, especially when um, raw honey does the job just as well. And imagine if you're adding all of these beautiful medicinal herbs to it as well, okay? So um, I have my raw honey that I'm adding to this saucepan here. Okay, and you know, you guys know I don't measure, but um, I'd say that looks like about half a cup of raw honey, eh, maybe three quarters of a cup of raw honey. And I don't like to cook honey. Again, you guys probably know that about me. I don't like to cook honey, but I'm going to warm this up a little, okay? Now, uh, yum. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna warm this up a little. I'm not going to warm it up quickly. I'm not going to cook it. I'm just going to like gently and slowly warm this honey up, okay? So that it melts a little more and warms up. And while I'm warming that up, okay, um, just a little bit ago, I found a juniper bush in someone's yard. Um, and it was kind of on the road, so I didn't even ask them. I just went into their yard and picked a couple branches off their juniper bush. And, um, you know, I, it has some beautiful, this is juniper, okay? You notice it has those beautiful little juniper berries on it, right? Now, if you're a botanist, you're, you're kind of saying like, Linda, those are cones. Yes, I know, botanically they're cones, but we call them juniper berries. Um, so what we're looking for is juniper bushes with the berries. You're gonna see a bunch of them that don't have the berries on it, that's fine. Juniper leaves are medicinal too, and we can, you know, like there's a juniper leaf with a couple berries on it. We can just put that whole thing, stem and all, right here into our honey. Um, but, you know, there's some beautiful juniper berries that fell off these branches. I'm gonna put them in there. So if I have about half a, let's say I have half a cup of honey in here, I want to put probably a quarter cup of juniper in there, okay? A good quarter cup of juniper. Um, leaves, berries, you know, stems. I prefer the leaves and the berries, okay? I'm just going to pull them off of these stems. So uh, my colleague and friend, uh, bro Robert Fox, um, just said that there are 37 tribal colleges now. 37, that's a lot, that's amazing. Um, it's such a great example of how tribal nations are serving their people. Because tribal colleges, like United Tribes, we are mandated that all of our classes and all the things we offer um, are culturally relevant, you know? So they, they are um, relevant to indigenous people, so it's pretty cool. Okay, so I have my, um, say, half a cup of raw honey in here. Um, that I am very, very, very slowly heating and on very low temperature, heating with um, some juniper leaves and berries, okay? 
I didn't take them off the twigs. You guys know I just never take the time to do stuff like that. I'm just going to set this aside. And while we talk more, um, we are going to uh, let that infuse, okay? Um, and so Linda is asking if all types of juniper berries are safe to eat. Yes, they are. Um, in fact, juniper berries sometimes are added. Uh, you guys might have seen me make wasna or um, also known as pemmican. Um, that's the combination of dried meat, uh, dried berries, and fat. And sometimes we'll actually add juniper berries to our wasna. So we'll use like the dried buffalo meat, um, the dried juniper berries, probably add some dried choke cherries in there too for some sweetness because juniper berries have a very, very strong flavor. Um, but we'll, we'll also add the fat. Um, okay, so um, down here, okay, so let, now uh, my friend Carlos and his partner Gretchen are asking about um, which species of juniper are edible. Uh, so there's a couple of questions. Now down here where I'm at, okay, here let me say first of all, that is if it is an actual juniperus, right, juniperus species, so botanically named that, there are none that are technically poisonous, none that are technically toxic, okay? Um, but uh, that said, um, there are different varieties that vary with edibility and how they taste. So first of all, there are some juniper species that are what we call, I'm not going to get too technical here, but this is important, okay? There are some juniper species that are monoecious, and there are some that are dioecious, okay? That means that some of them have both male and female parts on one tree, and then there are some species where there's a male version and a female version, okay? So if you ever see a row of junipers and um, the junipers are like, none of them have any berries on them, but all of a sudden there's one in that whole row that has a ton of berries, very often a bunch of males have been planted and then there's one female tree. Um, and that's the one with the berries. So, um, and that varies by species. Um, and I find that the ones that are, um, uh, where they have the male and the female separately, uh, those tend to be better, they tend to be tastier, and they tend to actually have more medicine, okay? Um, so uh, my friend Deborah is asking, is there a stage that the berries should be in, green, et cetera? I like them after they turn blue, but I'll tell you, I use juniper berries at all stages. It's been freezing here in North Dakota for weeks now, over a month, um, and I still went out and harvested those juniper berries today. And here, I just harvested one off of um, the branch here, and it's crunchy, super strong flavor. Um, very much that pine flavor, um, but nothing offensive about it at all. <sighs> Even just that one berry, I can feel it like opening up, you know, again, I'm asthmatic, opening up my breathing passages. Um, fantastic. Uh, so yeah, and then the, the berries, I will say, are more potent than the leaves, okay? So if you're making like a, this cough syrup for a child, um, you might want to use the leaves instead of the berries because it'll be more gentle, okay? All right, I'm going to share my screen with you guys and kind of, um, we'll, we'll do some more like sort of hands-on stuff, but I want to show you guys some plants specifically that are lung support, and sometimes I forget, you know? So, <laughs> like I forget which one I'm talking about. So, um, so let me just show a few. Okay, so here we have... Um, some sage, okay? Ceremonial sage. I mean, and, and you know, it just varies. Some people call it uh, white sage. Some people call it flat leaf sage. This is not the California white sage that you see in this picture or here in front of me, right? We um, collect this, we burn it. We use it ceremonially. That's why it's called ceremonial sage um, for smudging, for purification. Um, and the Lakota name of this is Pejijota Apeblaska, which means the sage with the flat leaf and you can see why, right? Um, but this sage is actually fantastic lung support. Um, it's antimicrobial. When you burn sage, it does so much more than just cleanse the air, uh, say, of, of bad spirits, right? Um, the, the sage, the smoke from it is incredibly, incredibly antimicrobial. Um, so it's really wonderful for clearing the air of airborne bacteria and even uh, viruses, 
Okay, so burning some sage is great. Now, here's the thing. This is a really important plant to indigenous people, okay? And so if you are not indigenous, if you're non-native, I urge you to find another plant, a replacement um, uh, from your own tradition that you can harvest, that you can grow, that's just as antimicrobial, just as wonderful for burning uh, because so many species of sage, including the California white sage, but also um, the one in front of you in these pictures are, are actually uh, becoming threatened by over harvest. And it, that would just be, you know, we've already, you know, indigenous people have already had to face so much. Um, but can you imagine like having to face the, the threat of not having any sage available? for ceremony and for use at home, it would just be horrible. So if you're not native, I urge you to start using something else. One of my favorite alternatives for lung support, for burning, for, for cleansing the air is um, rosemary. Rosemary, think about how delicious rosemary smells. Think about how easy it is to grow. <laughs> think about the fact that you can not only um, cook with it, but you can use, let me see, where's my rosemary? It's right here. I have a huge bag of rosemary, dried rosemary that a friend sent me, okay? Think about the fact that you can also use this in a tea, okay? You can use, um, oh, here's some beautiful, even fresh rosemary that a friend sent me. Um, you can uh, make rosemary tea that is wonderful lung support. You can use rosemary um, in a syrup. Uh, Do you guys know that rosemary essential oil will actually help to fight lice? So, um, you know, if you're working with um, uh, people who might be having problems with lice, uh, you can actually give them um, rosemary essential oil, and it's fantastic for preventing the spread of lice. Uh, but yeah, it's wonderful lung support as a tea. Um, you could, if, if I wanted to, for my juniper cough syrup, why not add a sprig of rosemary to that? Wonderful. Or some dried rosemary, right? But... Having uh, dried rosemary uh, sprigs around to burn in your house is a wonderful alternative um, to uh, native traditional sacred species of plants, okay? Um, and that's not to shame anybody out. It's just a, a plea for respect and kindness, right? Um, so yeah, but the species of sage that's up here, especially for my native friends who, who are on here right now, or maybe you grow this in your yard and you have ready access to it, even if you're not native, um, is incredibly antimicrobial. It's wonderful as a tea. It's wonderful to burn. Um, it, you can actually boil it down and use it to clean surfaces. Um, we make a, our household cleaner out of sage, adding a little bit of lemon juice or vinegar. So very, very useful and important plant. Okay. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, okay? Um, another plant that I use a lot for lung support, okay. This is another type of sage. This is actually, so, so check this out if we, if we go back here. So this is Artemisia ludovisiana. That's that ceremonial sage, but look at this. This is Artemisia absinthium, also known as wormwood. This is basically the sibling to the, um, to the, uh, uh, type of sage I was just showing you guys. Sorry, let me pull up my chat here if I can. Okay, I'll, I'll pull it up in just a second. Sorry if I'm, I promise I'll answer your, your question. For some reason, my chat won't, won't pull up. But um, this type of sage, this wormwood, is an amazing, amazing lung medicine, okay? Not only that, if you look at a lot of the research, uh, wormwood is actually being used a lot now specifically for COVID, okay? Um, uh, it's being used in countries all over the world, uh, Artemisia absinthium, but also its, it's sibling um, Artemisia annua, which is known as sweet annie. Um, but, you know, these wormwoods are amazing as a tea uh, for, or as a tincture um, for treating uh, inflamed lungs. Okay, so if you are someone who might have lung inflammation, whether it's from COVID or it's from asthma, um, or you know maybe you accidentally inhaled some bleach fumes when you were obsessively cleaning or something like that, uh, some some wormwood tea is wonderful, a wonderful remedy for you. Okay, 
So it's funny because my husband is in here pointing at me because there was a time in my life, I've calmed down a lot, but there was a time in my life um, when I was obsessive, literally about um, bleach and about like trying to kill germs and things like that. Uh, I have calmed down a lot. <laughs> And nowadays, you know, I'm making household cleaners out of things like vinegar and sage. So, ha ha. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, I'm going to actually uh, go on to the next one and then I'll get to some questions. Okay. I'll stop my share and get some questions. Um, I wanted to also bring up uh, mint. Now, I was actually just talking to a, an amazing uh, scientist last night. Um, who's also uh, an ND, a naturopathic doctor, um, uh, and, and uh, a chemist as well. And um, they were talking about the use of various mints in treating COVID, um, but in particular, treating the lung damage that is done by COVID-19, okay? And uh, we've actually been using mint from the very beginning for lung support, all of the mint families, lemon balm, uh, this field mint that's in front of you, peppermint, spearmint, they're all wonderful lung support. They help to heal the lungs. They help to open up bronchial passages, you know, all your airways, um, and they help, you know, uh, to keep your lungs healthy. So you can drink mint tea. You can um, uh, uh, put some mint in a pot of water and boil it and inhale that beautiful essential oil all the time. Mint is also antimicrobial. So if you're someone who's prone to lung infections, uh, mint is, is very good for that. Not to mention the fact that mint is very good for migraines and, and headaches. So um, you know, if you are interested, uh, mint is another fantastic plant for lung support. I probably have some sitting around here somewhere. Um, okay. Uh, bear root. Now, this is another one. Do you see that chunk of bear root I have sitting around here? Okay. So, uh, this is a large chunk of bear root. Um, <laughs> and it's beautiful. And this is amazing medicine. Um, we use bear root in a lot of different ways for lung support. Uh, in clinical trials, um, this, you know, there's the Lakota name there, Mato Trapejuta, which means the bear's medicine. Um, bear root is uh, a member of the parsley family, member of the carrot family, right? Parsley, carrots, celery, all related, bear root. Um, so it kind of has a very strong celery-like smell. And we are using this in a lot of our cooking, okay? Remember, food is medicine. We're using bear root in a lot of our cooking. Um, we're putting it into our medicine soups, and I'll talk about medicine soup in a couple of minutes. Um, we are putting it in all of our cough remedies. We're even putting it in our chest balms, okay? Uh, bear root is really important. Now, this is another one that is becoming threatened, becoming overharvested, and isn't being harvested sustainably by everyone who's doing it. So if you, um, <clears throat> if you acquire bear root, please, please make sure you do so with great respect and um, from someone who's, who knows what they're doing when they're harvesting. Um, uh, or uh, another, uh, this is one, another plant that you know, it's important that indigenous people have access to it. It's not just used for medicine. It's not just used for food. It's used for ceremony as well. And so it's so important that indigenous people have access to this. Um, also, um, one of the uh, doctors I was talking to last night uh, was saying that uh, there's a particular pathway um, among indigenous people and uh, people from uh, parts of Asia, like Mongolia, who have a particular pathway uh, where bear root, they're, they're more receptive to the medicine in bear root than people of European um, origin. So it works better <laughs> for indigenous people. And so, you know, it's just one of those plants that it would be really nice if it were left for indigenous people and you found an alternative. And actually, celery is super easy to find, super easy to buy, and it has a lot of the same properties. Simple celery, right? Uh, not quite as strong, um, but still, you know, celery is a good medicine too. Um, if you're looking for bare root alternatives, angelica, 
Angelica, the herb, some of you might be familiar with it. Make sure you know what you're doing because um, Angelica and even bear root can sometimes uh, look like poisonous hemlock if you're trying to harvest it yourselves. But Angelica is a very common um, uh, and, and even cultivated uh, root in Asia that smells and tastes and acts a lot like bear root. Okay, so if you have a choice, um, Angelica is a, is a great alternative to bear root, okay? Um, we actually use bear root in a lot of different ways, and you can do the same with Angelica. I just want to show you guys. Um, so we use a lot of bear root candy, or, or what we say, uh, candied bear root. So we take the bear root, and we chop it up really small, and we cook it down in honey for a long time to make candied osha root. Do you see that? That's just cooked down in honey. And this is actually made by friends of ours at Artemisia Herbs, okay? Candied bear root from Artemisia Herbs. Um, they're really, really good about harvesting it sustainably and uh, making this extremely accessible to indigenous people. So um, we like to support them. Uh, but this candied osha, um, it's delicious, first of all. But it, um, it's so clearing, so opening of the breathing passages and the sinuses. Um, it's wonderful. And the elders love it because they can just kind of um, suck on it, you know, and get that good medicine from it. And then you can just eat it, okay? Um, it kind of has a menthol-like effect um, uh, in your mouth. So it's kind of cooling and uh, uh, just really, really good medicine. Um, and candied osha is very good to make. And like I said, you can do the same thing with um, Angelica, Asian Angelica. Um, so all you do is, is put your chopped up, uh, bare root chopped up um, medicine into a crock pot with some honey and you put it on the very lowest temperature. Usually it helps if you have a warm setting on your crock pot instead of low. Low is too high for honey, okay? But a warm setting is usually pretty good. And then you can keep it in there for a day or even two, um, and you'll have candied osha, okay? Um, and we do use osha honey as well, and that's just um, uh, ground up bear root, so like a teaspoon of powdered bear root per, um, per cup of honey. And that's an awesome lung remedy as well, okay? So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, osha and bear root are the same plant. Osha tends to be the name that uh, European people use. Um, bear root is the name that most indigenous people use, okay? Um, okay, so nettles, um, and I do have some nettles here somewhere probably also. Uh, nettles are a fantastic um, herbal remedy. Uh, medicine for the lungs. Why is that? Nettles are incredibly anti-inflammatory, okay? If you are someone who's prone to sinus infections, sinus inflammation, if you are prone to joint inflammation from arthritis, if you um, had COVID and you still have a lot of um, inflammation in your lungs, in your joints, um, also, some of my friends post-COVID are experiencing neurological symptoms months and months later, right? They'll walk into a room. They're in their early 20s, and it's almost like they have early onset dementia. Um, they'll walk into a room, forget why they walked in there, you know, th things like that. Sometimes it's, it's much more severe, um, but, but a lot of those neurological symptoms are being caused by inflammation of brain tissue, inflammation, okay? Nettles are powerfully anti-inflammatory, all right? And so we are using a lot of nettle tea. Um, we're also using a lot of nettles in our, um, in our food. So here's some beautiful dried nettles that we harvested this year. And these dried nettles, um, we can put these into soup, we can put them into stew, we can cook them down and drink the tea and then take the boiled nettles and make pesto out of them, right? There's no reason to, to waste that. 
uh, if you make nettle tea, make sure to eat your nettles, okay? Eat the nettles that you boiled uh, because they're such good medicine. Um, so nettles are wonderfully anti-inflammatory. If you have inflammation in your lungs caused by all that coughing, um, it's really important. Here's another thing. Uh, one of the issues with COVID is that it is causing damage to the epithelial lining of blood vessels. We've talked about this before. Um, that means that your lungs will become so inflamed that it will feel like your lungs are full of fluid, but they're not. Your lungs are not full of fluid. So you'll cough, <laughs> and nothing will come up. Your cough is totally unproductive. You take your mucinex, you drink your tea, you try everything to get that mucus out, but nothing will come up. Well, oftentimes with COVID, you're not, your lungs are not congested. They're just inflamed, and it's causing damage to um, the lining of your blood vessels in your lungs, and um, uh, that's causing a lot of problems. So uh, uh, we need some anti-inflammatories and we need plants that are going to help to repair uh, our lungs, okay? Nettles is a fantastic plant for that. You can use them as a tea, you can eat them, um, you can uh, even use a nettle tincture, all right? Okay, um, all right, we have some gumweed here, Grindelia. Uh, you can, again, another one that you can use as a tea or a tincture. Uh, ch check that out. Here I have some dried gum weed for you, right? But look at the photo, the, the photos that I have in front of you. It grows sort of low to the ground like a bush or a shrub. It gets to be like 12 to 16 inches tall. But the reason it's called gum weed is because of those, or curly cup gum weed, is because of those sticky little tendrils. Do you see that in the photo? And you can see it right here. Like, look at this. Um, dried here let me see if i can get that closer up there for you this dried flower head here is actually still sticky okay even though it's dried and it smells really resinous that resin is wonderful lung medicine grindelia also known as curly cup gumweed is one of my favorite lung support plants and that's me personally as someone with asthma um I can take a bundle of, um, of uh, curly cup gumweed, put it up in the rafters of the sweat lodge in, uh, during allergy season, and when I get out of there, I'm not having any allergy problems for days. Um, I can make a tea out of this and drink it. It's wonderful. I'll put handfuls of the curly cup gumweed into a pot of water, put a towel over my head and inhale that steam. It'll clear up my lungs. It'll clear up the congestion in my sinuses. It's really wonderful, okay? So curly cup gumweed, such a powerful medicine. Okay, I'm just gonna stop here just for a second so I could answer um, some questions. I have lots and lots of comments and questions up here. Sorry about not getting to them soon enough. Um, okay, so would you ever use maple syrup to make this recipe or is honey more preferred? Maple syrup is a wonderful medicine. My friend Emily is asking. Maple syrup, as you know, is a fantastic medicine and um, it does help to control coughs. Not necessarily as well as honey does. It doesn't have quite the same compounds, um, but maple syrup does have other benefits. Uh, honey, um, uh, is, is, you know, fairly low glycemic index, especially compared to white sugar. Maple syrup is actually wonderful for, um, even for diabetics, even though it'll raise the blood sugar a little, there are compounds in real pure maple syrup that actually help to stabilize blood sugar in the long term. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, is there a stage the berries should be harvested? I harvest them all, time, all the time if it's juniper. Rosemary is one of the five ingredients in thieves oil um, from Julie. Uh, it's used uh, during flu epidemics and the Black Plague. Absolutely. Rosemary is incredibly antimicrobial. Again, um, it's used internally and externally. Uh, rosemary oil, um, cinnamon oil, lemon oil, um, clove oil and eucalyptus oil. I believe, so, so sometimes there's four thieves, sometimes there's five. <laughs> Rosemary is one of the oils used in thieves, absolutely, because it's so antimicrobial. Um, we actually are not just using rosemary. We're using rosemary, we're using thyme, we're using oregano. All of them very antimicrobial. Um, all of them were used not just during the Black Plague, 
sorry, is, is my internet a little weird? Um, uh, sorry about if I pause there. What I was saying is that rosemary um, and, and oregano and thyme, all of those culinary herbs that you think are just in your kitchen, um, are, are just in your kitchen as, a, uh, as something to, to use, uh, you know, for stuffing or, you know, for dishes, those are medicine, okay? Um, if, you, if you are someone, if you've ever studied the history of Indian cuisine, Indian from India, uh, you know that a lot of the herbs that they use in there, the curries and those spice blends are actually traditionally, uh, they were medicine. They were used in foods to, to, to kill um, uh, uh, bacteria, to kill um, even, even viruses, right? Um, to help people heal. And so um, rosemary is another one of those. It's not just a culinary herb. Rosemary is an amazing medicine that I, that I highly recommend you keep around at all times. Not just rosemary, the plant, but rosemary, the oil as well. Um, okay. And um, my friend Renee is talking about um, bear root uh, that's called OSHA. Absolutely. Um, how long can you keep bear root for? for? Mariah is asking. Um, bear root, uh, we, we actually, I've never, ever. Bear root is so precious that I've never thrown it away. And um, one of my friends has a piece of bear root that he got from like his grandfather when he was five years old. He's in his 40s now. He still uses that bear root. He'll burn it every once in a while when he's missing his grandpa. Um, and it still smells exactly like the day he got it. To me, it, like I, I've, I've actually smelled it when he burned it and it doesn't smell any different. So I, I, as far as I know, the essential oils, the medicine and bear root will not dissipate over time as long as it's kept like this. If you powder the bear root, that's a little different. Um, it'll go off a little faster, okay? I mean, you can still keep bear root powder for years, um, but probably not for decades, okay? Um, Shelly was asking where I got the bear root. Um, it was actually gifted to us by a friend um, from Oregon uh, who, who harvests it themselves on their land. Um, so how long does OSHA last after being harvested and dried? I've kind of talked about that. Um, I found some bare root. Uh, yes, absolutely. She said it's still fragrant after five years. Absolutely. <laughs> it will be. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back, uh, to, to, um, to the PowerPoint in a second, but, um, we were talking about the curly cup gum weed. Um, so, so I wanted to say that like we were making food kit deliveries. You guys know we deliver food and medicine kits to people. We were making food kit deliveries yesterday um, and uh, it was snowing and it was snowing like crazy and there was already inches of snow on the ground and um, uh, there was a ton of curly cup gum weed growing on the side of the road. And it was, it was actually a road that's very sparsely traveled. Um, and I got out and the curly cup gum weed, even now in mid-December, was still good, okay? So if you needed the Grindelia, the curly cup gum weed, you, if, if it grows where you live, you could still go out and get it, even right now today, okay? Um, uh, it still was resinous and sticky, uh, the flowers were, so, so you know, you could get it. Like, like, I think everyone thinks, especially on the prairies, that um, in the winter, that's when medicine is done and you can't harvest anything. But again, I was harvesting the juniper today. I could have harvested curly cup gum weed yesterday. I saw some rose hips growing today, which are super high in vitamin C and very good for preventing infection. Um, so you can, there's still a ton of medicines out there that you can harvest even in the middle of the winter, okay? Um, so another, um, uh, an actual, something I wanted to talk about, you guys have seen me talk about fire cider numerous times. Look at this beautiful jar of fire cider. Um, so my friend, um, Lola Agard gave me this jar, this beautiful jar. Um, and I had an empty jar and I was like, okay, I have to fill that with fire cider because, um, you know, I don't let any jar, jars sit around empty. I try not to, I, I fill them all with fire cider. But this jar was sitting right next to my kitchen counter, okay? And I happened to like have some, uh, I can't remember what we were cooking that day, but I had some leftover onions. So I just threw them in there. And I had some leftover garlic cloves. I, I know you're thinking like, how can you have leftover garlic? You know, just put it in your food. Um, and I do, but we did have some leftover garlic that day um, that we didn't use. So I just threw them in here. 
And I kept this jar on my counter and I poured some vinegar over the garlic and the onions. And then a couple days later, I made some fire cider, um, but I didn't have enough room in my jars for all the turmeric that I had. So I just threw it into this jar and I poured a little more vinegar over the top of it, okay? Um, I was canning cranberries and we had one quarter of a container of cranberries left over. So I put cranberries in here. Um, I chopped some celery and I, I um, wasn't using the celery tops. So I threw those in here. I had, I had some leftover dried chilies. I always have leftover dried chilies sitting around my house all the time. So I threw those in here, okay? Um, what else did I have? Oh, I had some leftover ginger root. You know, we were making stir fry that day and I threw some, um, I even threw the peelings from my ginger in here. Right? There's no reason to waste those peels. Um, I threw them in here and just kept covering it with vinegar. And now I have a gorgeous big jar of fire cider that's going, you know? And, um, you know, I think this is a week old. I threw some, oh, I threw some leftover horseradish uh, that we didn't use in here as well. And I'll just let that go. That's fire cider, right? You guys have seen, heard me talk about it numerous times. Fire cider is also wonderful lung support, okay? Do not um, underestimate the value of fire cider right now. Not only is it great lung support, not only does it help to keep your lungs strong and clear and healthy, uh, it also helps to thin mucus. So if you're having trouble with congested sinuses or congestion in your lungs, it works as an expectorant, just like um, mucinex, right? It works as an expectorant to thin that mucus and help you cough it up and get it out. Um, it's also full of vitamin C, right? The, the fire cider is full of vitamin C. And so it will help you... Um, prevent infection. Vitamin C helps to prevent infection. Uh, I, it's crazy because I was talking to a cardiologist years ago, and I, I've talked about this before, but I was, I was talking to a cardiologist, and he, um, he gives his patients um, IV vitamin C at like 10,000 units through an IV every day before they go through surgery. And he said that since he started doing that, Okay, and I think he does it for like four or five days before surgery. He said since he started doing that, he has not had a single case of post-surgical infection of that, of that chest incision from open heart surgery. Not one case of post-surgical infection since he started doing high doses of vitamin C. So I really recommend um, a lot of vitamin C, particularly if you're someone who's prone to infections, um, uh, lung infections like pneumonia. Okay. Some people are very prone to, to lung infections. And once you get pneumonia, it's so easy to get it again. Right. Um, so, uh, I really recommend, um, a lot of vitamin C. All right. Um, my, my, uh, friend, um, my Mashke, my, my dear friend, Rupa Maria, she's a doctor out in San Francisco. Some of you guys might've um, heard of her. She is an amazing physician. She was recently exposed to COVID. And one of the things she did, um, she was exposed, but she never got sick and um, never tested positive. And one of the things she was doing was 5,000 IUs of vitamin C in the morning and 5,000 IUs of vitamin C in the evening. Okay. Um, so, uh, so Emily's asking, when it comes to fire cider, are you using strictly organic ingredients? It can be hard finding organic ingredients close to the res if you don't grow your own. Oh my gosh, it's so true. And that's, you know, um, Emily, I do not like living in town, okay? But I do live in town. Um, and one of the benefits of that is that we have a co-op and a natural food store here. And so I do go and I'll get, um, I can get small amounts of organic food. And um, I try to use organic ingredients only in my fire cider just because, you know, the vinegar is pulling all the stuff out of the plants. And um, it's basically like a tincture, right? And you don't want to tincture um, uh, things with herbicides and pesticides. So while I recommend um, using um, that, you know, as much as possible, while I recommend using organic as much as possible, it's not 100% necessary. And, and believe me when I say that um, 
not every batch of fire cider I have ever made has been organic, <laughs> right? I mean, it's so hard to find organic ingredients, almost impossible on the res. So, um, you know, what I will do sometimes, okay, and, and is when I go to town, okay, when I lived on the res, um, when, what I would do is when I go to town, listen to this, I would buy a bag of organic onions, okay? Then I'd take them home, and I would chop the onions up and pour apple cider vinegar over the top, okay? And I would let that sit. Then the next time I go to the store up in town, um, I would find organic, you know, maybe I'd find organic chilies on sale. Maybe I would find organic lemons on sale. Uh, maybe I'd find organic ginger at the market and it was super cheap or super on sale. Um, or I would have my friend from Hawaii uh, send me some beautiful turmeric root right? Fresh turmeric straight from Hawaii. Um, <laughs> then I would chop that up and add that to that same jar with the onions and I would let that sit. So I would add it one ingredient as a time, as, at a time as I could afford it. Um, and and that's, it's a great way to, to make organic fire cider. But you don't have to do that. If you're not using organic lemons, I suggest peeling your lemons and just adding the flesh, okay? If you're not using organic onions, peel the onions. If you're not using organic ginger, um, you know, peel the ginger. With the roots, it doesn't make quite as much a difference, but it does help, okay? Um, Cheryl Yazzie was talking about using fire cider as a salad dressing, and I do too. I add um, a little bit of, um, olive oil to my fire cider, maybe a little uh, freshly crushed black pepper, and fire cider makes a fantastic salad dressing, okay? I mean, fantastic. And it's a medicinal salad dressing. Who doesn't like that, okay? <laughs> All right, so um, I wanna talk about a couple other things um, uh, as we're going. Um, another one, oh, you know what? Let me pull um, my PowerPoint back up. Let me share that again with you guys. So we were talking about, um, the, of course, the curly cup gumweed, amazing medicine, very easy to find, um, grows all over. Uh, I also wanted to talk about choke cherries. Okay, right here, you guys can see this, can't you? Hopefully you can see the PowerPoint and my camera at the same time. Um, here I have some choke cherry juice, okay? If you guys have ever heard of wild cherry bark being used for lung support, like for asthma, um, it is one of the, the, you know, wild cherry bark and wild plum bark are one of the most amazing um, remedies I found for my asthma attacks. Like if, if I'm having an asthma attack, which isn't often anymore because I've really worked on making my lungs super strong um, and recognizing my triggers. Um, but if I am having an asthma attack, you know, uh, you know how some people we use an emergency albuterol inhaler. I can drink choke cherry juice or wild plum um, juice, and it will actually help to open up my lungs as well as an inhaler. It's amazing. Um, and all we've done is juice the choke cherries, okay? So uh, my friend Lisa Caceres uh, gave me this gorgeous jar of, um, of choke cherry juice, and I, I mean, it is just so treasured. So thank you, Lisa, if you're on. <laughs> but oh, and I wanted to say, um, think about your fire cider. When you strain your fire cider, you could actually add choke cherry juice in there and make choke cherry fire cider. Um, if you prefer wild plum juice, you could add, you could make wild plum fire cider, right? That's the great thing about fire cider, especially as a lung support, is that you, there, you know, you're only limited by your imagination, okay? Um, there's all kinds of things you can add to that to um to make it beautiful and to make it your own and to make it really useful i think my mashke my friend tpz we young she actually has some fire cider for sale right now um, on her page uh which she's using the proceeds of that to support the funeral of a beautiful elder who died of covid so um if you get if you need some fire cider you can find her um, but yeah, so choke cherry juice is wonderful um, and choke cherry bark even, but you want to make sure you cook it, right? Uh, choke cherry bark actually does contain cyanide. So you want to make sure if you're using uh, wild cherry bark as a tea, make sure you cook it down, okay? Um, cedar, uh, we are actually using tons of cedar right now as lung support. If you have some access to beautiful cedar, um, please don't buy or sell cedar. It's another, you know, really sacred medicine. Um, but if you have some access to cedar, 
oh my gosh, that smell. <laughs> Cedar is just one of my favorite smells in the world. And what, what we're doing is we're actually um, uh, boiling cedar in, in pots of water and just very slowly letting them steam throughout the house all day and let that cedar ste steam get the whole house, right? Not only does it put moisture into the air, um, but it also is antimicrobial right? So it'll kill um, bacteria. It will eliminate viruses, um, all from that cedar oil uh, being, uh, you know, in the steam throughout the air. So put a pot of cedar leaves um, in water on your stove and just let it go all day with a very low steam, okay? It's wonderful for the air. Remember, COVID is um, cold and dry. COVID is cold and dry. So it's very important to have humidity in your house. Okay, humidity, um, COVID and, and other viruses, like even influenza, they hate humidity, okay? So keep your house humid. Put a pot of water on the stove and let it boil down. Put, put some cedar in there, put some juniper in there, whatever you have, put some rosemary in there, okay? Um, super important to do that and very effective, all right? Um, let's see here. Um, mullen. Gosh, I can't believe I haven't gotten to mullen yet and we're almost, almost done for the day. <laughs> um, mullen, that fuzzy leaf. Um, I, I've heard some elders here. So apehishma means like the hairy leaf or the fuzzy leaf. But I've heard some people refer to it as um, onze paquinte, which means to wipe your butt. So Indian toilet paper. <laughs> so, you know, if everyone makes the run on the stores for all the toilet paper, uh, you can go out and gather some um, mullen leaves as an alternative. Okay. It's not Charmin, but it works. Okay. <laughs> so, but mullen is incredible lung support. It's not an indigenous plant. It's not, it hasn't been here very long. Um, in North America, but it is amazing. And many indigenous people are using it. I have a beautiful bag of um, fuzzy, fuzzy mullen leaves right here. Um, mullen and mint work very well together. So a mullen mint tea, wonderful for lung support. Um, I, now here's, here's a word of caution, okay? I actually am very sensitive to the hair on here. I can't even, like if I open this up and I handle it with my hands, even my hands get itchy from the fuzz on here. Not many people are as sensitive to mullen as I am, okay? But um, I'm very sensitive to it. So what I do, I still drink mullen tea sometimes, but what I do is I filter it through a coffee filter first, all right? So if you think you're sensitive to those little hairs, to that fuzz, make sure to um, filter it very well through a coffee filter first, okay? Um, some people even, you know, along with uh, making a mullen tea, they'll uh, make like a mullen um, uh, tincture, uh, and that's fine. I'm not as into tinctures as I am teas, you guys. They're just not as traditional. Plus most tinctures, most, are made with alcohol, and um, so I, I try to steer clear of that. But, um, you know, technically fire cider is a tincture, or what, what nowadays they have a fancy term, they call them an oxymel, right? <laughs> so um, you can, you know, put mullen into your fire cider. You can put mullen into um, to all kinds of tinctures, okay? But I prefer it as a tea, and I feel like it works best as a tea, okay? Um, now, uh, uh, you can also, some people even burn mullen and let that smoke go into the air. Um, and, and they're actually inhaling the smoke from mullen to help with lung issues, all right? Now, I personally don't do that because I'm so sensitive to those hairs. And if those hairs become airborne, uh, that's not good for me, okay? But some people do that and they have great success with it. Notice those beautiful yellow flowers on that stalk on the, in the left-hand picture. The flowers are like curly cup gumweed. They're sticky and resinous. And so you can make a wonderful tea from the flowers, but you can also, this doesn't have to do with lung support, but listen to this. You can actually use those flowers. My friend, Rain was actually telling me um, uh, that you can use those flowers to make a wonderful ear oil for ear infections and ear aches. So you can soak those flowers in olive oil for a week or two, strain it, and use them as eardrops. Okay. And she said it will get rid of an ear infection um, right away. So wonderful medicine, Mullen. It's, it's, it's a gift, you know. We're, it's one of those things, you know, it's, we're kind of glad that it moved in. <laughs> 
Okay. Plantain. Um, one of my friends uh, who's from Germany told me that you cannot buy cough medicine in Germany that does not have plantain in it. Now they use the narrow leaf plantain. What I have here in these pictures is the broad leaf plantain, but you guys have seen the narrow leaf plantain as well, I'm sure. And they both make wonderful cough remedy. Um, and, and here's the thing. Remember I was saying COVID is cold and dry? Um, plantain is, is a moist plant, right? It, it's it's, um, it's kind of slippery. Uh, like when you cook it up, it becomes very slick and kind of thick right? Um, the term we use is mucilaginous. That doesn't sound appetizing um, because it sounds like mucus, <laughs> but you know, it becomes kind of thick like that. Um, and that's good because that is so good for um, getting, you know, uh, getting things moving, right? It, it's almost like it, you know, when things are really stopped up in your lungs and it's stubborn and you can't move it, Things like mallow, like marshmallow leaf, and like plantain, um, and even like basswood leaf are what we call demulcent. If you've ever seen that word demulcent, it means that it's basically moisturizing for the inside, okay? And, um, and plantain is one of those. So plantain in a tea, plantain soup, plantain in your salad. Um, I don't mean to sound like Forrest, you know, Forrest Gump, like Bubba Gump or Bubba, but um, <laughs> plantain always is wonderful uh, for your lungs, okay? And narrow, it doesn't matter, narrow leaf plantain or the broad leaf plantain. I have always used this type of plantain for burns um, and for food. I have not always used it for lung support. It's been something that I've recently found is amazing and just as good as the narrow leaf plantain. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, that's like the PowerPoint that I have for you guys. Again, I apologize um, <laughs> for the PowerPoint, but this time of year, it's so important for you to um, see the pictures of the plants and know what they look like and know what I'm talking about. Uh, so yeah. Um, okay. So just to get to a few more questions before we end, uh, please discuss harvest cherry and plum bark. Um, for preparation. Okay, I will do that. Just give me one second. Um, so Lulu is asking about um, or saying that she's dipped the dried stock of mullen in wax and it makes an amazing torch. Yes, Lulu, absolutely. Um, we actually uh, have used the tops of um, mullen as a torch without dipping it in wax and it was it was still incredible and it lasted a long time. Um, so yeah, I mean just as a, you know, that's a survival tool right there. Um, we make a uh, mullein ear oil plus garlic. Oh, you talked about that. Oh, so, so Jess is saying that they make that mullein ear oil and they also put garlic in there. Yes. Wonderful. And garlic ear oil is fantastic. Um, plantain pesto. Absolutely. Plantain and nettle pesto, even better. Um, can you use plantain if dried? Absolutely, Jen. Uh, dried plantain, we keep uh, um, some of it, we try to keep it in our kitchen all the time because we use it for burns, um, but it's just as good um, cooked down into a tea or you can boil it into a tea um, or steep it and drink that. You can even make a cold plantain infusion. Just put a, a handful of dried plantain leaves in cold water, let it sit overnight and drink that as a tea. Wonderful. Uh, Linda, oh yeah, goldenrod. I did not have time, Linda, to talk about goldenrod today, and I totally forgot to put it in my PowerPoint um, as a reminder, but I use goldenrod tincture, goldenrod oxymel, goldenrod tea for lung support right now, and goldenrod is wonderful for the liver. Remember, COVID doesn't just attack the lungs. COVID attacks the brain, right? Our, our neurological stuff. COVID attacks our liver stuff and our kidneys. Um, COVID attacks, um, you know, uh, all of these systems, right? It causes inflammation in our muscles and our joints. Um, and goldenrod is wonderful liver support and kidney support as well. So not only, um, if you're using goldenrod tea, not only are you... Um, and actually, uh, my friend Floris White Bull, she's putting goldenrod into her medicine soups even. Um, and not only is that so great for uh, lungs and liver and kidneys, it's great uh, in, uh, um, uh, for all of those systems. Uh, Jess is saying that they've been using a lot of lobelia. Yep, we don't have as much lobelia out here, but um, it is wonderful for lung support as well. Um, 
Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yep, I, I, am, I recorded this, Paula, so I can send you the link to it if you remind me and ask, okay? Um, let's see. Um, yep, plantain being used on spider bites, absolutely, and, you know, bee stings and bug bites. <laughs> it's wonderful, okay? Um, so can you harvest goldenrod in the winter? Eh, no, not really. It just does not have the medicinal compounds. I know it's standing there beautiful and dried on the side of the road, but I really use, when I use goldenrod, I use goldenrod uh, flower at the height of its like bright yellow freshness, right? And I, I do use some goldenrod leaves as well in there. That's fine. Um, but you want them when they're bright green and fresh, okay? Um, and let's see. Uh, Julie, yep, I'll be posting this. Oh, yes. So before you guys go, please don't go before I touch on medicine soup, you guys. Um, right now, a lot of us are making medicine soup, and I, I, I started calling it medicine soup um, sometime during this pandemic. And it was because I, I, you know, a bunch of us were making soups for our communities and soup mixes for our communities. And we were like, okay, that's great. I'm putting bone broth in here. And bone broth is very anti-inflammatory. Bone broth is so good for the lungs. Chicken bone broth, um, organic beef bone broth, right? You don't want to, like, I'm, it's hard to find. Actually, organic beef bone broth is like $4 a box, which is pretty fair. And you can mix it with, um, with water, you know, because it's very strong and concentrated. So um, I highly suggest if you're using bone broth to um, see ya, Emily, thanks for coming uh, to, to make sure that you're using organic bone broth if possible. But chicken, buffalo, boil your buffalo bones down. You guys, all bone broth is, is bones. Uh, take your turkey carcass from maybe when you make a whole turkey, stick your turkey carcass into a pot of water with some onions, ginger, garlic, hot chilies, <laughs> Oregano, rosemary, all of those medicines, onions, garlic, ginger, uh, turmeric, make a beautiful golden bone broth with your turmeric. Um, uh, you know, throw some cedar in there if you want to. Throw a little bit of um, juniper berries in there. You know, don't, don't worry about it and just boil the hell out of it, <laughs> okay? For a long time until that reduces by like half. If you start up with 12 cups of water in your turkey carcass, reduce it down till it's like six cups of, of broth, okay? Um, it takes a long time, but it's so beautiful and anti-inflammatory. Then you take that broth and you, you strain it, okay? And then that's when you add your wild rice, which is like fantastic support for your whole body, you know, indigenous harvested, wonderful wild rice. That's when you add a beautiful chopped onion in there. That's when you add, um, you know, some, some gorgeous uh, beets in there. Oh, beets and beet tops. Oh my gosh. That's when you add, um, you know, to your bone broth, add all of this medicine, add some beautiful uh, 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 flint corn hominy, add some beautiful beans. Okay, for the fiber. Um, imagine how that tastes, right? Absolutely delicious. Um, and again, don't forget to put your chilies in there, your, your hot chilies, which are wonderful for lungs as well. Don't forget um, to put, you know, put your mushrooms in there, you guys. Don't forget to put your mushrooms into your soup. Oh my gosh, your, your, your ch powdered chaga, your reishi mushrooms, your shiitakes, your lion's mane, put those in there. That's medicine soup. Okay. Um, and, and, and we're lucky that food is medicine, you know, because we can make all of that, that beautiful medicine soup and we can eat that and it's delicious, but we're nourishing our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Right. Um, so that's medicine soup. <laughs> all right, you guys. Um, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for coming on. It's been so fantastic to have you. I, I wish I could keep talking to you because I have so much more to talk about. I didn't even get to everything. Um, I have my juniper. Um, you can see that just slowly infusing and slowly melting down in that honey there. Um, it's, it's barely, I could even put my finger in here because it's just barely warm. Um, I, I will probably take this off the heat and just let it sit overnight. And then I'll strain it out in the morning um, and I'll have a gorgeous juniper infused honey for coughs. Um, or heck, I could just do spoonfuls of it because it tastes great, <laughs> right? So um, 
Anyway, it's been wonderful talking to you guys and seeing, um, seeing you. If you have any questions about lung support, if you have any questions about places, um, you know, to get some of these herbs, uh, we try to get them from indigenous people as much as possible. Um, uh, let me know. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Mwah. Love you guys so much. And please take care and please stay safe and uh, take care of each other. Okay. Have a good one, you guys.